Chapter 10. A New Dress. I don't know how I could have managed to complete my task if it hadn't been for the electric lamp Inky brought me, along with a special magnifying glass that she borrowed from somewhere. The magnifier looked like the kind that Mr. Aparmian, our town jeweler, used to use when he was doing repairs. It was like a one-lens eyeglass with its with it fitted over my right eye, I could see every twist and bend in each silken knot. With painstaking care, I used two sewing needles to untangle the VF from the first handkerchief. As I feared where the stitches had been, holes remained. When I restitched IP, I tried to incorporate the old holes as best I could. Give me that, said Inky, snatching the jewelry's, the jeweler's loop from my brow. I held my breath as she examined the stitch, the stitch work on my first altered handkerchief. This is magnificent, she declared, handing the loop back to me. Honestly, I didn't think you could do that. I exhaled in relief. Oh, so thankful that she had approved. I knew that there were still some damaged fibers that showed through, but if she didn't notice them, I wasn't going to point them out. The rest of the handkerchiefs were easily was easier now that I had done one, but it still took me the entire morning to complete them. My head was pounding by the time the whistle blew for lunch. Come back early if you can, said Inky. There's so much work for you to do. Yes, ma'am, I said. I felt like slapping her. I stood in line for my turnip soup and colored water, craning my neck, looking for jewelry. I found her at a table at the back, sitting with a pale-faced Zenia. Luca, I said to her urgently as soon as I sat down, how is he? Julie met my eyes and smiled. He's going to be fine, she said. Once they washed away the blood, it turned out to be not such a bad wound. They stitched his leg. No broken bones. I was so overwhelmed with relief that I thought I was going to cry. Is he still in the hospital? Julie put a spoonful of her meat soup in her mouth and swallowed. They're giving him injections to make sure he doesn't get an infection. He should be out in a couple days. My heart sank. Injections? Julie shook her head. Don't worry, she said. He's in one of the good rooms. They are treating him. But I did worry. I took a spoonful of my turnip soup and swallowed down a vile lump, then turned to Zenia. Her, eye, her skin was papery white, and her eyes looked huge. The repair I had done on her dress was not holding up very well. One shoulder was covered by mere threads. She picked up her tin cup and sipped some of the colored water. What job do they have you doing in the kitchen? I asked. Killing potatoes, she said. My stomach grumbled at the thought of all the potatoes she must have seen. Are you able to sneak any extra bites? She shook her head. The cook was watching me like a hawk. But it's better in the kitchen than in the factory, she smiled. I smiled back at her, then caught Julie's eye. I need to see Luca. Julie looked at me with alarm. He will be out in a few days. You can see him then. I stared down at my bowl of soup. Julie was right. It would be easiest to wait, but I had an ache at the pit of my stomach every time I thought about him. Until I saw with my own eyes that he was fine, the ache would stay there. Is the medical staff at lunch? Julie nodded, tipping her head slightly in the direction of the far corner. 
They're mostly here now. I picked up my bowl, gulped down the rest of my soup, then stood. See you later, Julie and Zenia. I touched my lips with my index finger, and they were both silent. I could feel two pairs of eyes on my back as I walked out. There wasn't much time left before lunch would be over, but I didn't want to draw attention to myself by hurrying. I took my bowl, cup, and soup, and spoon to barrack seven without washing them first, then walked with what I hoped looked like nonchalance towards the hospital. The only person I passed along the way was the warden of one of the other barracks. She hurried past me as if I didn't exist. When I got to the hospital, I pushed open the door and stepped into the main hallway. The cool medicinal air enveloped me, and I was struck by the eerie quiet. I was relieved to see that the receptionist was not there. I poked my head into the first room. Each bed was filled with a sleeping ostrobator. They all looked clean and bandaged. Odd that they were all sleeping at the same time. Is that what the injections were for? I was about to step back into the hallway when I heard footsteps. I hid behind the door and watched as a nurse walked into the room and took the pulse of a patient, marking something on her clipboard as she finished. My own pulse raced, and I held my breath. She checked out a few more patients, then walked out the door. I waited until she was in the next room, then darted out the hallway and into the third room. Luca was there, and like the others, he was fast asleep. I stood at his bedside, my heart pounding. Should I wake him or leave him alone? His face was too pale, but he looked well cared for. I brushed my fingertips gently through his short black hair. His eyes opened. Lita, he whispered, clasping my wrist with a strong grip. What are you doing here? Checking on you. He smiled. I'll be fine. His eyebrows knitted into a frown. I'm glad you came. There is something I need to tell you. He pushed himself up to a sitting position and looked around at the other hospital beds, making sure that everyone else was still asleep. He crooked his finger, and I stepped in more closely. If we are separated, he whispered, I will find you after the war. I looked at him in alarm. Do you know something? Go. You can't get caught in here. Before he could stop me, I planted a light kiss on his forehead. I want you out of this place. Luca smiled. Me too. I stepped behind the door, just as the nurse walked into the room. I waited until he, she was busy with a patient, then slipped out. I hurried down the hallway, but when I opened the d front door, Julie was standing there. Hide around the corner, she said. Two of the nurses are on their way. I slipped around the side of the building, waited a few minutes, and scurried back to the laundry. My heart was still pounding by the time I got there, but I couldn't stop grinning. I had seen with my own eyes that Luke was fine, and I hadn't caught, gotten caught doing it. Altering the monogram on Inky's fur coat was relatively easy. The black, satiny material that lined the coat seemed to smooth back into its original weave as soon as the red stitches were removed. It was like embroidering on completely fresh cloth. It took me less than an hour. I had left the blouse until last. The label was narrow and the material itself was slippery, so it was difficult to hold on to, let alone to remove stitches from. Before I started, I sketched the ornate letters onto a piece of paper so I, could, I would remember what they looked like. Inky wanted her name to be embroidered in a similar fashion. I sketched out Inky's name in a few different styles of the paper and let Inky choose. Because it was better to make mistakes on paper than this delicate fabric. 
Iggy was so pleased with my work that she took the blouse from me as soon as I was finished and put it on over her work smock. The blouse was tight on her, and I was horrified at the thought of her ripping it to shreds and then expecting me to fix what, fix it. But what could I say? You look beautiful, is what I decided on. Inky grinned. She ran into her office at the back and grabbed the fur coat, slipping that on over the blouse. She twirled around and the fur coat flailed out, flared out, swirling in soft lushness, the scent of rose water whispering to my nostrils. You are such a divine little worker, said Inky. I would like to reward you. She hurried back to her office. When she returned, she was no longer wearing the fur coat or the blouse, and in her hand was a wax paper package tied with a string. Here, she said, as your reward, I saved you half my lunch. My mouth filled with saliva at the thought of the del delights in that package. Each day, Iggy ate two sandwiches, always thick slabs of meat, between generous slices of freshly baked bread. Even though the paper I could even through the paper I could smell garlic, onion, beef, rye bread. Against my will, my hand stretched out and caressed the paper. Take it. You deserve it. I held the wrapped sandwich in both of my hands. This was the most precious gift I had ever received. How I longed to tear the package open and gobble down the sandwich. But a sandwich would be quarter in an instant. And after eating that and enjoying it, how could I go back to the turnip soup and colored water? I pulled my hands away and clutched them on my lap, willing them to be still. Please, ma'am, I said, looking into her eyes. This is very generous of you, but what I would really like is a new dress. Her eyebrows knitted together in confusion. A new dress? Will you get it to wear a clean smock every day? She looked down at my bare feet. Maybe a pair of woolen socks instead. How wonderful it would be to have a pair of thick socks, especially with winter approaching. How long would they last? I still ate my feet still ached constantly, especially at night. It was tempting to say yes to the socks. But if I wore socks, how would that make Zen how, how would that make Zenia, who was nearly naked in her ripped dress, feel? And Ivanka and Natalia and the others in my barrack. Me wearing socks for sure to make them feel worse about their own situation. My friend Zenia, I told her, she was injured yesterday in the bombing, but aside from that, her dress was ruined. That's why I'd like a new dress. Inky's eyebrows rose, and a look of astonishment transformed her face. You would give a well-earned gift away to someone else? I bowed my head and stared at her shoes. Yes, ma'am, if that's allowed. Her warm hand brushed my shoulder. You are just like my husband. He works hard for the luxury goods he acquires, but then he sends them to me. She brought in a huge basket of clothing for bending and sorted through it, a look of concentration in her eyes. I can't give you anything too fine because it will only cause problems for you. Not this, not this. This isn't good either. She looked up at me. Ideally, I'd give you. I'd, I'd like to give you a smock, but they're not mine to give. She continued sorting through the basket, then pulled out a flannel shirt, dark blue, with, to with a torn sleeve. Her eyes lit up. Stand, she said. Let's see how long this is on you. She held it up to my shoulder. The shirt came down practically to my ankles, but it would work for Zenia. She was taller than me. Ah, oh, this is perfect, she said, handing it to me. Are you sure you, would, you wouldn't like a pair of socks? And